Jesus wears this garment that is without stain. And he exchanges it with us for our garment that is completely stained by sin. It's almost too much to understand. Yet that's what he does for us. Without question. He stands in the gap. And it's like this rescue plan that God had to reconcile us to him. I'm so incredibly thankful. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what he says in his word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach. And I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand his will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, before we get into today's episode, I have a quick word. I know you've been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. Listen, I know, I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, which helps you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I include lots of cultural and historical information, and it really makes these familiar passages of scripture just come alive. This is a great study to do on your own, to do with some girlfriends or even some teenage girls, and it will help you really gain the confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. You can find that on my resources page at shehears.org. And for a limited time, I'm offering all of my podcast listeners a special discount of 20% off. You can use the discount code hearing Jesus that's one word all caps to get your discount there are also some free videos and a leader's guide for you to get started again head to shehears.org and you can find the bible study on the resources page hey friends welcome back to the hearing Jesus podcast today we are in day three of the study of woman and I'm going to read from John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11 It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people were coming to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. Today we're talking about guilt. Yesterday we talked about shame, which is the feeling that accompanies guilt. But today we're talking about the act of being guilty, guilt itself. We've all been there. In fact, you may wonder why I started with the emotion yesterday instead of the act today. But in all honesty, I'm not sure that we would even want to deal with guilt if there wasn't the emotion of shame attached to it. Like if we could just be guilty without feeling anything, um, I'm not sure that we would ever even want to deal with that. Have you ever met someone who never feels guilty? They never realize their own responsibility for their actions. They never allow themselves to take the blame when they're wrong. Many times they can do that because they have dulled their senses to the emotion of shame. And I think shame is part of what drives us to our knees in order for us to not only recognize our own guilt, but then to deal with it. 
So just to, to reiterate, when I talk about guilt today, I'm not talking about feeling guilty. I'm talking about being guilty. And so there's a difference between the two. Um, when I look at guilt, I think of our responsibility in our own actions falling short. And so as we look at the story of the woman, her guilt was indisputable. She was caught in the very act, just like ours. Our guilt is indisputable. And so before we go any further, I want to give you a heart check, some space to sort some things out if you need to. Yesterday, I asked you to identify some areas in your life that you had carried shame or maybe that you continue to carry shame. And you might have been a little hesitant to do that. And if so, it's okay. But I want to dig a little deeper into that. There may be things that are knocking quietly, secretly, on the inside of your heart. Those things that have been done in secret. The things that no one else knows about. The things that you've justified and explained away because someone else caused them or led you to them and you felt helpless. Those things. He wants to take the guilt and the shame of those things and exchange them for forgiveness, for restoration, for peace. But before we can get there, we need to name them. We need to confront them and we need to confess them. For a long time, I just refused to even pray about some things that I felt that either they were justified because someone drove me to do them or because I felt like God would understand why I ended up there. Regardless of how or why we ended up where we did, we still have to understand our guilt before we understand the the one who doesn't carry the same stains that we do. Jesus is the only one that didn't carry guilt on this planet. And so standing next to him, his garment is clean. Remember we talked about wearing a stain of sin like a garment. His garment is clean. Ours isn't. I want you to take just a couple minutes to think through those, through those things so they're at the front and center of your heart and mind. So there's some good news. We have a Savior who longs to take the guilt away from us. And so that guilt that we all have is the very reason he came to rescue us. He knows that we're all going to arrive in this place, this place of condemnation and accusation. But here we see Jesus teaching in the temple when this woman is brought to him. And as they start to accuse her, they're bearing her guilt for everyone to see. Jesus doesn't react, he responds. And there's a difference. And just because he doesn't initially say anything, don't think for one second that it means he isn't responding. What do we see Jesus do in response to the questioning of the scribes and the Pharisees? It says it in verse 6. He stoops down and he writes in the dirt. And so many times I've read that and I kind of wondered what it meant or I thought it maybe what he was doing. And I think most of the time that I've read that, I just assumed that he was playing in the dirt, maybe thinking through a response to them, buying some time but fidgeting. But after studying this, I have a completely different opinion. They were in the temple, and the floor of the temple was paved with stone. So when Jesus reached down to write in the dirt, it would have been visible what he was writing. In fact, the word for wrote in this verse is the word grapho, or maybe it's grapho, like graphite, that would make sense. But that word doesn't just mean doodling. It means putting something into writing, or like engraving. It means literal words on a parchment or a piece of paper. It's not just the, the motion, but it's the, the act of creating a word. And so how do they respond to Jesus writing in the dirt? My sense is that they're so wrapped up in their own agenda that at first they can't even see his agenda. They can't see what he's doing. We're like that sometimes. As believers, as the church, we get so wrapped up in our own agendas, our own demand for answers, that we can't see what Jesus is doing. So they probably don't even see what he was written and they keep questioning him. And what was his response? In verse seven and eight, we see that. And he says, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Now I had had a vague understanding of what a stoning would be like 
like we all do, I think, we can imagine. But I didn't really understand the gravity of what they were demanding. So in a tradu traditional Jewish stoning, a punishment that was used for many types of sins in that culture, the guilty person would first be stripped naked, which she was already naked, we assume. <clears throat> but then they would take them to a place outside of the city, and they would be thrown from a ledge at least twice as high as their own height. And so the witness to the crime would be the one to push them from the ledge. And if the guilty person didn't die from the fall alone, then the witness would have to take a large stone, throw it down, aiming at the person's chest. And if that didn't kill him, then the other witnesses would also take large stones, throwing them down until the person died. This is what she was facing. This is what they were asking Jesus about. This punishment, which they thought was humane because it was quick, this is the punishment they were asking Jesus to condemn her to. Jesus, a man that was known for his love and grace and mercy and compassion, but yet this is what the law required. Do you understand now the heaviness of his response? They were trying to trap him. So Jesus responds by asking the first stone to be cast by whoever was without guilt. And what happens next changes things. What does Jesus do next? He bends down and he continues to write. And this is the act that starts to change their perspective. Verse 9 says they finally heard it. And heard in the original text is the word akeo, A-K-O-U-O, which means to understand or comprehend. And so after understanding finally what he was saying and doing, they were elegecho, E-L-E-G-C-H-O, to be shown to be wrong. So do you realize this is the only account we ever have of Jesus writing something? And after seeing their reaction, coupled with the fact that this is the only time we ever read of Jesus writing anything down, I don't think he was just doodling. So what do you think he was writing? Most scholars believe that he was writing out a list of the individual sins of the witnesses one by one. That's why one by one, starting with the oldest that had the most sin, started leaving. The only one that was without sin, Jesus, was exposing the sin of the accusers. Do you know who scripture also refers to as the accuser? The enemy. It was the enemy that was accusing her. And it's the enemy that accuses us. They were also attempting to accuse him, but in the face of Jesus, the only one who is holy and set apart from the stains of sin, their own sin was revealed. You see, sin is revealed in the presence of a holy God. There's no way that sin can stay hidden, and it's our sin that separates us from God. So the very nature of who he is, in that climate, sin cannot stay hidden. Jesus reveals, not only to them, but to us, the very reasons that we have no authority to accuse anyone else because we ourselves are guilty. We ourselves have sin that separates us from God. Just one sin separates us from God. It doesn't matter the level of the sin. We're all separated because of our sinful nature. And so these men realized that one by one as their own sin was revealed in the presence of Jesus. And they were not qualified to condemn her because they themselves were guilty. We may not be guilty of adultery, or maybe we are, but we're all still guilty of something. It's the very sin nature that we are born with, and there's no getting around it. We can either stand on the sidelines, calling out others for their sin, or we can walk them to Jesus to find the forgiveness and grace that we ourselves have experienced. So the choice on which path to take is yours. When we realize our own need for a savior, it takes away this sense that our sins are not as bad as their sins because we're all guilty and we all need Jesus. God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you. Then in the midst of our own guilt, you rescue us. The only one without sin coming to exchange garments for our sin covered garments. God, it's so hard to even understand sometimes. Lord, we are humbled and convicted. And right now, Father, I pray that you would intercede on behalf of my friend, that you would help them to name the things that have kept them bound. 
and the ways that they have maybe stood in the way of others getting to you. Lord, I pray for your forgiveness in those things. I pray for your discernment. I pray for you to reveal the things that maybe even are hidden in our own hearts and minds that we don't want to admit. God, reveal them so that we can hand them back over to you. God, I thank you that you desire a relationship with us. I thank you for the treasure of your word. And I pray that it would continue to convict and empower and equip my friend today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His. Hey everybody, I'm Dale. And I'm Tamara. We're hosts of the Kainos Project podcast. Where we help you tackle ancient Christian truths in everyday settings. To learn more and subscribe, go to lifeaudio.com.